Hi, my name is Dr. Mireli Saponte, and I am so glad you're here with us today. I'm a neural learning and inclusion expert, and today I have the privilege of having an amazing colleague with me, Dr. Lourdes Allen, and she's going to be talking to us about the seven strategies to succeed in the virtual academic environment. Now, Dr. Lourdes, I have known her work, and she's an academic achievement specialist for many years, and she brings all her wisdom to us. So welcome, Dr. Allen. I'm so glad that we're spending yeah. our time together and sharing this amazing topic. Well, I, am, I am so excited, and especially that this uh, video is being done for District 131 uh, that is up north, uh, Dr. Mirelis. I don't know if you're aware. So we are going to be sending this video to people that are getting very close for winter. So they're getting ready for, for, for a very different environment from Florida. So this is being recorded from Loxahatchee, Florida. And I'm so glad to get started with the seven strategies to succeed in a virtual academic environment. So are we ready? Let's go. We are ready. I know your first one is amazing because I talk about this all the time. So talk to us about your positive attitude and hope. Well, I'm, I'm telling you, I mean, you're a psychologist, you more than me, I believe you know, that it's so important to have a positive attitude and to have hope. Uh, because a positive attitude is something like, it's a feeling that is contagious and it's transferable. So one of the things that I tell the parents all the time is that if you have a negative attitude, if you're depressed, if you're anxious, if you have like a view that this is the end of the world and things will never get better, this is not gonna help your child achieve academic success because for your child to be motivated to succeed, he or she needs motivation. And the lack of hope, a negative attitude is a motivation killer. As a teacher myself, because right now I'm teaching at the college level, but I'm also teaching geometry at a high school. I don't know, Dr. Mireles, if you knew that. I mean, I'm I know you've been teaching at both levels and quite a challenge. I know we've shared a lot about the different physical challenges and things that we've had to do to continue moving on. But one thing that I love about you is that you really leave these strategies. You leave that positive attitude. You get through it. And I know that this is what you want to get to the parents. And, 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 and I don't know if you're aware that all these movies that are out there about the zombies, about the end of the world. And then I'm wanting my students have like an apocalyptic mentality. And they have said to me, why should I do homework? Why should I complete my assignments? Why should I be reading if this is gonna be the end of the world? And, and their attitude is so negative, like there's no hope. So my first strategy for the parents is to believe that this pandemic is gonna be over, things are gonna get better, we're gonna go back to a new reality, but it's gonna be a good life, a good future for you and your kids. Because if you don't have a positive attitude right now at home, that is going to have a negative impact on your child's academic success because a negative attitude and the lack of hope is a motivation killer it is a I think, uh -huh. but your second point is very important too because you can have a positive attitude but you got to be in charge you got to take that responsibility and I love how you put this together and how you put the order of them because you do have to be in charge talk to us about that Dr. Lourdes okay first of all you, you have to have a positive attitude you have to have hope but you also have to be in charge that means that you have to sit in the driver's seat when it comes to your child's education you know in many ways the American educational system is like a tricycle not a bicycle the student is the front wheel leading the, the, the process uh, the academic process to ensure that your child uh, needs, academic needs are met. Let me give an example. I have students that are learning English. So that means that my instructions have to be aligned to his or her needs because if they don't master the English language, that means that I have to provide instruction in such a way that he or she can achieve academic success. There's a lot of students that have learning disabilities. So we as teachers have to accommodate our instruction to ensure that kids that have learning disabilities can also learn. So that means that the front wheel of the tricycle will always be your child. But the tricycle has two back wheels. One is the parent and the other one is the teacher. And what are those two little wheels for? If they're connected to each other, they're supposed to provide support and balance that students need to reach academic proficiency. You know what, uh, Dr. Mirelis? 
researchers always, I mean, I know that I'm, 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 I could be your mom, you know, even before you were born, Dr. Mireles. Researchers all agree that peer involvement is a leading indicator of students' academic success. That has always been the truth. Teachers alone, we cannot do it. I alone cannot help your child achieve academic success or reach his or her maximum potential. But now, with this pandemic and having to provide instruction in a virtually manner, the role that you, as a parent, play in your child's education has been magnifying. The role that parents play in a virtual classroom setting is significantly greater because because the students are learning from home, not in school. That means I don't have access like I used to have before with your kids. They are behind the screen, I'm here. And you want Dr. Mileris, it's even more complicated when they turn off their cameras and, and they mute their phones, they, they, their speakers. So that means I don't see your children. Sometimes I don't even know how their voices sound. So it's so difficult for me to connect with your children in a virtual environment, especially when the cameras are off. And Dr. Mirelis, uh, you all agree with me that all, all parents are comfortable having their cameras on because they want to protect their privacy. But sometimes parents are not aware of the role that they have to play in a virtual classroom setting is bigger than it used to be before. Teacher online minimizes my ability to establish a teacher-student relationship, supervise your child's behavior, and encourage engagement. This is our, the reality for now until your children can come back to the building and be with me in a regular classroom setting. It is challenging times, but you said it all the way at the beginning of the second strategy. You have to be in charge. This is the moment. This is the, the time. Maybe before we, you know, we were a little bit more flexible and kind of dependent more on the teacher, but this is a time where that tricycle makes <laughs> and everybody has to put their part in it so you're totally right well you know having to be in charge but to be in charge i know you teach this third strategy which i love and you've taught me so much about it because it's our daily schedule we actually need to be you know we, we need to be constantly planning and you show me how you do this every day i've even improved a lot of my daily schedule because of what you have taught me so tell us more about this third strategy. You, you know, Dr. Mirelis, you and I, we have something in common. We're planners. We plan everything. The first advice that I would tell every parent, don't try to plan your child's life if you don't plan your own life together. So the first thing that you have to do is establish a schedule for yourself as a parent. If you want your kids to wake up early, you have to wake up earlier than them. If you want your kids to have breakfast at seven o'clock in the morning because they're high school kids and school starts at 7.30, then you have to wake up earlier. You have to establish and not only establish, you have to monitor a regular daily schedule for you and your children. And this schedule should include the time even to wake up. I have students that are still in pajamas when they're taking the class. I have students that haven't even brushed their teeth and they look like they just got out of bed. That is not right. It is not appropriate to go to an online virtual class when they haven't even cut their hair. So that means they have to have a time to wake up. They have to have a time to go to bed. They have to have a time for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And they have to have a very precise time to log in in class at least five minutes before the class starts. Engage, participate, and most of all, learn. And you know what is my greatest challenge? And this is a geometry teacher teaching in a high school right now. Not so much with my college kids, because my college kids are paying for their courses, so they tend to do their assignments. But at the high school level, public education, my greatest challenge is that my students are not completing their classroom assignments and the parents don't even know about it. The next uh, uh, component of a very good schedule is they need screen and mental breaks. Oh, all day in front of a computer. Their eyes are exhausted. They need breaks. They need to connect with their friends. They need to relax, play, and have fun. They need to engage in physical activities. And Dr. Mirelis, I have learned that a lot with you. You believe in physical activity. I know that you work out with the entire family. Part of having a healthy home environment 
is including activities that your kids can exercise because not everything is in front of the computer because you're learning online all day and then they grab their smartphones and then they spend the rest of the day looking at that little screen. This is not healthy, Dr. Miguel. So, so one of the things that I tell parents is, yes. take a break. Yes, and that your brain, your brain is actually made in a way that the best way that it learns is in little spaces and times again and again. The more that we schedule them, the more that we organize it for our brain, that's how it's going to end up being a good result. But sometimes we as parents are not as organized, so it's very difficult to do it with our children. And we're not talking about being, you know, rigid and strict. There's days and there's days, but Certainly, daily schedule is a plus plus for our brains and it just makes learning even better. So now you, you already mentioned a little bit of this fourth one, which I really love because not a lot of people have considered into this one and is the home environment. Now, how important it is to set up a special place for us now to work. I know there's so many different settings parents have you know, sometimes a smaller home and too many kids on the same home and everybody working from home. So it is a challenge, but what are your recommendations now? And what are your strategies for making a home? I, I, I mean, you know what, uh, right now I have a better life. Thanks God, I learned English. I, I went back to school and I had better jobs than I had before. So I know what is to live in a very little apartment. I know what is to have three kids sharing the same bedroom. So I don't want the parents to have an idea that my life has always been a life of abundance. Uh, most of my life, I grew up in poverty. So I want the parents to understand that I'm not referring to uh, that you should have a big house, that your child should have an office. No, no, what I'm saying is whatever place you decide for your child to learn, that's a place that has to be respected. Doesn't matter if it's a small place. The most important thing is that you check what is behind. You don't have to find a place in the house that is appropriate when your children or yourself are communicating via video. Like right now, you parents, you have access to my background. So that means that you can see whatever I have on the back. So I have a lot of my students that their parents are passing by, the parents are yelling at the kids. I have kids that are changing their clothes behind, their, their, their siblings that are taking class online. And sometimes I see things that I should not be seeing. So the most important one is, if your child is gonna have the, the, the camera on, you gotta make sure that your privacy is respected. Number two, you have to find a place where students can focus and stay focused throughout the lesson. Remember that the class is not one hour, it's not three hours. They're all day taking online classes. So you have to make sure that whatever place you choose in the house, it has to be a place that they can focus throughout the day. Number three, you have to choose a place that they can, that you can always supervise them. Oh. This is so important. You know that I have students that log into my classes while they are really sleeping? They log into my classes, they turn off the, 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 the camera, and, 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 and then I talk to them, they're not even there. They went back to sleep because the parents believe that if you give them a desk or the school gave them a Google Chrome notebook, that that is all known. If you don't supervise your kids, your kids will not be complying or doing what they must do to achieve academic success. An idea that I have for you, maybe you like it, maybe not, is uh, you can go to one of those stores that they sell electronics at the Best Buy, and you can buy some little cameras and put it on the roof or you can put it on the wall and connect them to your smartphone. I have one of my colleagues that do that and she's teaching, she's also a mathematics teacher. Her girls are at home learning, but they have a camera and every 30 minutes she's watching them be online and learning and studying. So the kids know that mama is watching all day. Use technology to supervise your kids. And even if you're home and you're cooking, you have your smartphone right there, you put it right there so you know what your child is doing because trust me, some of my students, they are not taking classes, they are sleeping, they just log into their classes and then they go back to sleep. Number four, it has to be a place in your house Big house, small house, apartment, whatever it is, but it's free from distractions throughout the day. And that distraction includes sounds, all kinds of sounds, dogs that are barking, uh, uh, lights, 
some of my students have so many lights, like Christmas lights, Halloween lights, and the room is so dark, and they have Halloween lights, and that is so distracting or smells. Sometimes the parents are just cooking and cooking, and the smells is so good that it's like a big distraction. So you have to be free from distractions. And this is very important. Did you know that the internet is not equal in all parts of the church? That in the house, the internet is a little bit different, especially if the house is big. So wherever your child is sitting to take his or her online courses, you have to make sure that that internet is very strong. And number six, to create a home environment that is conducive to academic success is to provide a space to place instructional materials. I, I mean, some student, my students, their space is so small that in the middle of the class, I can hear that the laptop fell on the floor. The laptop fell because the place is so small that there's no space for the workbook, for the book, for the pencil, for the sharpeners, for the papers, for the calculator. So that means that the desk is supposed to be like rectangular, a laptop is in the middle, but they're supposed to have space on the right and a space on the left where they can put all the instructional materials. But well, I had a doctor, Rinetti, sometimes <laughs> I, I think it's a lot. No, but I, uh, think, I think- I think it's a lot. It you know, what we're doing is a lot. What, what, we, what parents have had to do, it's a lot. At the same time, I think it makes sense that we are able to have these strategies on board because I think they are, they are so useful, what you're giving right now. Sometimes it's things all parents have gone into this without resources. So this is great, you know, great advice for everybody that maybe we're in the middle of the semester, but we still have time to get set, get ready, you know, and accommodate and make things better for each and every household. Now, you mentioned already a little bit of technology. So I know this next one is really important because you are telling us to stay up to date, to stay tech savvy. And I think this is something that everybody can do. If anybody can handle one of this, I think they can stay tech savvy, right? So tell us more about why, you know, your strategy about parents staying tech savvy and why is it important? Because parents who are ed tech savvy, so it's ed tech savvy, they understand, they understand the basics and the processes of virtual instruction. They can use devices, apps, programs, and media to effectively support their children's education. You know, some of us were experts on this, like you say, uh, Dr. Mireles, we can take pictures, we can take videos, we can chat, we can send texts, we can, I mean, I mean, we use WhatsApp, but the technology that is used for academic purposes is a little bit different. So that means that the parents have to learn how to use the technology programs, devices that are used for teaching online, which is a little bit different. And then there is no shame in asking uh, the what, when, and how of all aspects. You know, sometimes the parents are so embarrassed, oh, because I don't want people to know that, I don't know. You're not supposed to know because you, you're not a teacher, you're a parent. So you are supposed to know how to ask questions. You ask questions, uh, which kind of technology does my child need? What kind of internet does he or she needs? What apps are you gonna be using? Are you gonna be using Google Classroom? Are you gonna be using Zoom? Are you gonna be using, uh, uh, what technology programs, devices are you gonna be using? And when and how are you gonna use it? Uh, the thing is that parents must seek help to better understand how to use school issue devices, the laptops that the school districts are giving, the tablets, and whatever the school is using to provide virtual instruction. There's no shame in asking questions. Listen, there is no shame. And actually, I think that the key to that and to asking those questions is your next strategy. I told you, you've, added, you've put all the points on all the dots in this sequence. And that is why I love it, because I think one of the ways that you're going to achieve that ed tech tally, um, is going to be by connecting with your child's teacher. Now, actually, I was reading, I was reviewing some material from Mark Miller, um, a great leader in, in, in companies, in leadership. And he was saying that key, the key for us to be successful in anything is gonna be the way we communicate. Now, I think these positive communications that you're talking about here are key. So tell us a little bit more 
about why it's so important to connect with the teachers, why it's so important to, to be, you know, uh, connect and communicate in a productive manner. Yes, the, the Dr. Miriam is, I've been a teacher since I was 19. I graduated uh, University of Puerto Rico, very young. So at the age of 19, I was already teaching pre-calculus at a high school. And I'm 65, I'm still teaching. So I have, I don't mean, I forgot how many years of experience that I have uh, teaching. And one of the greatest challenges that I've always found is that sometimes parents, they don't know how to communicate with teachers. They communicate in a way that is positive, and it's productive. Right now with this pandemic, uh, right now, Dr. Mireille, I have students that come to my classroom. I have four or five in my classroom and I have 16 that are learning uh, online. So I have to look at the screen to take care, to instruct, to in try to engage 16 students that are online, plus I have students in the classroom. So that means that, that, that I'm being bombarded by so much work. And sometimes I feel that the parents do not understand that they need to be flexible and exercise patience because sometimes it, it is we're overwhelmed by work. And not only that, we are also dealing with the pandemic. We're also parents. So the first thing that I ask you as a mother, as a father, Please be flexible and exercise patience. Find out what is the best way and the time to communicate with, with, with the teachers. And let me give you an example. Right now with elections, I don't know about you, Dr. Mirelis, but I get at least like 10 texts a day asking me to vote for one person or to vote for the other person. Then I get texts that they're asking me if I want to buy something, if I want to evaluate something. This phone is continuously ringing. Either I have a call from somebody that I don't know, or I get an email from somebody that I don't know, I'm getting text. So that means that you have to find a way and be patient. What is the best way? What is the best time to communicate with that teacher in such a way that that communication can be productive and positive? And always be careful with the tone of voice and that you're using. I make sure that you use a tone of voice that is honest and tactful. It was last week that I had one of my colleagues, she was so sad, it's like her day was horrible. She also teaches mathematics and she said, you're not gonna believe what happened to me. I'm overloading checking papers. I have 100 students and a parent just called to yell at me. And they say, I cannot believe that your grades are not loaded in SIS. I wanna know how well my child is doing. Mom, I'm still checking the papers. I have 100 students. Your children turn in their assignments, but those papers have to be checked. So, so the parent didn't understand why the grades were not uploaded, but that was enough to create so much pain and to ruin the teacher's day. So that means choose words that are appropriate to the situation and non-inflammatory. Remember that teachers are also humans. If communicating via video, like I'm doing with you right now, and taking on a listening role like you're doing right now, make eye contact and focus on the speaker and never interrupt the person you're speaking with, never interrupt. And I think if you practice that, sooner or later, your teacher, the, the teacher and you are gonna be so connected that the person that is gonna win is gonna be your child because there's nothing more powerful than a teacher and a parent connected in a positive and productive manner. Totally, I agree completely with every one of these uh, recommendations. And your last one connects to everything that has been previously say, said, which is, supervise and support. I love that, that we, we, we tend to want to always just supervise. So I want, I want you to talk about, you know, why your point is both because it's so important to do both for our children, not just to supervise the work, but also to support them because these are really tough times, not only for the parents and for the teachers, but for our students who are really going through all these changes. They're still having to adjust to a whole different way of doing their academics. And life has also changed for them. So Dr. Luders, tell us more about why supervise and support as your seventh strategy. And, and let me tell the reality. Uh, when you have been in the planet for more than 50 years, we know that crisis come and they will go away. Sooner or later, the COVID-19 global pandemic will pass. I promise you that. Parents must supplement with home activities while their children are learning in school to ensure that their children are not staying behind. 
Because the problem is that, that the online instruction is not the same like I'm with them, like they're in the classroom, and I know that your child is a little bit confused. I'm going to get out of my desk. I'm going to ask, uh, like, for example, Jose, are you okay? I look at your face, and I see that you're struggling. Do you need some help? Why can I ask your daughter to come to my desk? I would explain you how to solve this math problem and again. I don't have that ability anymore. So I mean, in this situation, Dr. Mireles, in this situation, parent involvement is so important, not only to supervise, is that you have to do activities at home. You have to look for programs. You have to find videos. You have to find websites where you can support what your child is learning online because online instruction alone will not be enough. I mean, you are gonna say, oh, come in, Dr. Lourdes, that's easy for you, or Dr. Mireles, that's easy for you because you have your doctors or you went to school for many years. I know that not every parent is the same. And there are even parents that they might not even master the English language. And so, so what I'm saying is, Whatever you do, big or small, maybe you can do it, maybe you need help. Maybe you have to go to a website. Maybe you have to get a program for free. The thing is that just being online is not enough for your child to be at grade level. You know what is my concern? That once this pandemic is over, your child could be below grade level. According to experts, they say that that, that, that once this, this pandemic goes over, you know, we're done with it, they say that a great percent of students will be performing below grade level once this pandemic is over and they go back to brick and mortal school setting. They believe that the students least affected in reading, the students least affected in mathematics, the students who are at grade level when they go back to brick and mortar school setting are those whose parents are involved, not only supervising, but also supporting their child's academic process. So that means that right now, a lot of experts are writing that we're starting to have a gap. There is a gap, a reading gap, a mathematic gap. And what's gonna be the gap? The gap between the students whose parents are supervising and supporting and the students that are pretty much on their own that the parents don't even know that their kids are sleeping when they're supposed to be logged in into their classes. Sadly, but that is the truth. Oh, you parent, don't let your child stay behind, especially in reading and mathematics. There's a lot of free stuff out there. I'm not asking you to buy uh, anything new. I'm not asking you to pay for a tutor. What I'm asking you is to find resources that will support what your child is learning online. All right, and there are so many ways. Sometimes we think that the support only comes through technology, more technology and more technology, but actually sometimes the support comes with being them on different activities that not necessarily have to be in a computer or on a computer or on a game or, you know, it, there's so many ways of doing it. We just have to find ways around it. And you are correct. Those parents that are engaged during this time, I think that the most disadvantaged we, we are going to find is those parents who are not being involved in the education of their children. And that's why we're here. That's why we're talking about this yes. so we can help them, so we can support them, so we can give them that, you know, that little push to say, we're here for you. We're here to support you because you need to be there to support your children. Now, a few last words with this have been amazing seven strategies that everybody's gonna be able to start using immediately. But I know you have a last few words before we say goodbye. Okay, the, the, what I want to say is uh, that uh, these are hard times. I just let me be honest with you. I have never, never in my life gone through a situation that I'm going through right now. A situation that I'm teaching mostly online. A situation where I have to work a mask all the time. A situation that I cannot hug my students. A situation that I cannot go around the room asking my students uh, if they are behind. Is there anything that I can do to help them? I cannot see them smile, Dr. Mirelis. They all have masks. Those are the ones that are coming to the building. I don't see them smile. So I only see their eyes. These are very hard times. So I'm not going to fake it and say, oh, this is nothing. No, this is big what we're going through. Well, there's something that I learned, Dr. Mirelis. That's something that I learned in life. That I have to use any obstacle. I don't have to use any obstacle that is in my life 
as an opportunity to grow rather than excuses to quit. So I only have one choice right now. Either I can quit and I can say, you know what, this life is difficult. I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to teach anymore. I don't want to be in this anymore. But I can use this opportunity to get to know my students in a way that I never knew them before. I can use this opportunity to learn how to love my house, how to be closer to my husband, how to learn new technology. You know what? My life has changed so much. I'm not the same person that I used to be before. I think I'm becoming better. I believe that I'm becoming stronger because I'm using this obstacle of the pandemic as an opportunity for me to grow rather than excuse to quit. So I ask you, dear parent, that you're listening to me right now, how are you going to use this pandemic being at home, not having the same freedom that you used to have before? How are you going to use it as, some, as an opportunity to quit and let go and forget about everything and this is the end of the world. No, 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 this soon will pass. We're gonna have a better and brighter future. Let's use this opportunity as an opportunity to do things that we have never done before. Learn things that we have never learned before and most of all to grow closer to the people who we love. That is amazing and Dr. Lourdes, we want to share with everybody how they can reach for more information. I know you've got some of your information there for us. This has been an amazing seven strategies that we all can use. And I hope you have found it useful, practical, but you know what? You got to take action today. This is the day that you make the decision to be that amazing support for your children. And let's just move them forward no matter what. So it was a pleasure being with you, Dr. Lourdes. Yes. This is amazing. So have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.